And now for the, the, the main events of the evening, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing um, two, two men who will be speaking to you tonight about impeachment and those issues about restoring our Constitution. Um, I'll introduce them one now and then one a little bit later. The first is John Nichols. John Nichols is an American journalist and author of The Genius of Impeachment, The Founder's Cure for Royalism. He's a media activist and political blogger. He's been a political correspondent for The Nation magazine. Actually, he is a political correspondent for The Nation magazine. Um, he is a frequent guest on radio and television. He's a co-founder of Free Press, and he is working on a more competitive and public interest-oriented media system in our country, much needed. Please welcome John Nichols to the stage. Thank you very much. I am an optimist, and so let me begin on a note of optimism and say that I believe Colorado is a visionary and good enough state that someday it will reverse the error of its past I'll let you fill in the blanks. <laughs> and elect Mike Miles to the U.S. Senate. <laughs> I cover the U.S. Senate for a living, and let me tell you, we desperately need this man. Turn your energies toward that task, please, because Washington, Washington is a quagmire second only to Iraq, <laughs> and we need to bring in the special forces. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I appreciate your being here. I'm honored to, to share a podium with you. I am honored as well to be in an event organized by such wonderful grassroots activists. I won't go through everyone's name because you know them better than I, but I will thank Barbara for sharing her home with us and for being such a wonderful player in putting all of this together. Barbara. I want to thank all the rest of you for, for coming out tonight. I want to pay special tribute as well to a friend of mine who flew in from Las Vegas where he was uh, counseling candidate Dennis Kucinich as he debated on Thursday night. My friend and comrade, one of the great pioneers and activists in the impeachment movement, Steve Cobble. Steve will inform you of your responsibilities and missions as the evening goes on. I also, uh, I do want to want to mention someone who isn't here this evening, but of course made this all possible, brought us all together, and that is George Bush. <laughs> well, you know, it, he is. A, he has done a lot to bring us together, and I have to tell you. You know, look, George Bush has, has done more to put the issue of impeachment on the table than anyone since the Founding Fathers. He has brought me together with some of the most wonderful and committed patriots in this country, so I owe him a, a debt of honor. He has, as well, offered us a measure of comic relief in these difficult times. <laughs> the president recently traveled to Australia. Now, Australia is, and you guys worry about having James Dobson be from here, Australia is a member of the Coalition of the Willing in Iraq. 
Uh, that is the countries that by and large were dragooned into participating in the occupation of a sovereign country, mainly by pressure because they had signed on to trade agreements or, or wanted to join the European Union or some other reason that they were forced to send some of their precious sons and daughters to Iraq. Australia actually willingly went because they have a Prime Minister, John Howard, who is arguably as bad or worse than George Bush. Now, when in the small as bad or worse club, uh, someone has an election coming up, and John Howard's face is an election this fall, uh, you know, everybody gets together and, and pitches in. And so President Bush recently traveled to Australia to help to shore up his, basically his one remaining ally in the world. And, and it was a remarkable event. They had the entire Australian press corps there, and Australians were tuned in watching on television. The President of the United States, most powerful man in the world, the man whose finger is on the nuclear trigger, stood before the Australians, and he turned to Prime Minister Howard, and he said, Prime Minister, I want to thank you for sending Austrian troops to Iraq. It is a complex and difficult task to imagine if we could make up anything worse than George Bush's presidency. But I will tell you that as the president traveled to Australia, he was not alone on his journey. My friend Matt Howard traveled with him. Now, the president arrived on Air Force One. Matt arrived on a commercial airliner. The president's travel was paid for by the American people. Matt paid his own way. Matt is a veteran of two stints in Iraq, a U.S. Marine who served in the initial invasion of the country and then returned for a second tenure of service on the ground there in some of the toughest fighting in the country. Matt went to Australia because since he left the Marines, he has taken it on himself as a personal responsibility to travel wherever he can in the world that George Bush travels to in order to tell the people of that country that there are Americans who swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of this country and who take that oath seriously, that there are Americans who believe that George W. Bush should be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. The interesting thing is that Matt emailed me when he was down in Australia. He said, you know, it's incredible. Down here, they have a media that actually covers American politics and government. I've been on TV. I've been on radio. Everybody's talking about impeachment in Australia. And I said, well, you know, someday in America, we will follow the Australian lead. <laughs> but I want to tell you about Matt tonight, if I can. I met Matt in March of this year when Cindy Sheehan and I went up to the state of Vermont. We were invited to Vermont to uh, travel to different towns that would be holding town meetings, the traditional New England gathering of citizens. A group of Vermonters had decided that they were not willing to wait any longer for Congress. And so they were going to put the issue of impeachment on the warrant, on the bill of particulars, for town meetings up and down the state. They had hoped to get about a dozen towns to vote to impeach President Bush and Vice President Cheney. As it turned out, 40 towns throughout the state voted to impeach the President and Vice President. They asked Cindy and myself to come up because we were among the more prominent advocates in the country for impeachment, and they thought it would be valuable to have some folks move up and down the state and, you know, preach the gospel of uh, democratic renewal. And so we decided to do that, but we said, you know, Vermonters, as best we understand, are a rather independent lot, and they might want to actually hear from some Vermonters as well as a Californian and a Wisconsinite. 
And so he said, if you've got any vets in the state, why don't you send them along with us on the, on the trip? Now, that was not a friendly act by Cindy and myself. It turned out that the tour, three days, took us to 11 different communities, more than a dozen different speeches. They didn't feed us or let us sleep. Uh, but the, it was good we had a Marine with us. And they did send Matt along, and Matt spoke before us each time. And, you know, this was the first time Matt had ever spoken in public. And he told a story. And I have to tell you, I wish I could claim that Cindy Sheen and myself have some sort of moral power, some sort of ability to convince people. But the fact of the matter is, by the time Matt had finished speaking, I don't think there was anyone in any of the rooms of the several thousand people we spoke to who didn't believe it was time to get rid of George Bush immediately. Matt's story was of the first day of the war in Iraq. As Matt explained, they traveled out of Kuwait City. They were given preparation for their invasion of one of the oldest civilizations on Earth, a half hour of historical background. They were given no language training whatsoever. Then they were put on a superhighway. I know this is hard to imagine, but before we started bombing Iraq, they had highways and hospitals and schools. All the things that, you know, it's wonderful to hear. You look in the press today, they say, hey, there's real progress in Iraq. They've just reopened this highway. Well, you know, it was open before. <laughs> and, and so they started heading up from Kuwait City to Baghdad. They said, travel as fast as you can. Move quickly to take the capital. So they did. These were Marines. They were following their orders. But, of course, on this highway, there was traffic across the highway. And the Marines were told that as you come to a crossroads, because we have a caravan of trucks, I want you to stop the traffic. Remember, half hour of civilization training, no language training whatsoever. So they come to one of the first crossroads. And the man, the Marine traveling in Matt's truck, a young, handsome, able fella, jumps out. And he does what a Marine does on a base to stop traffic. He puts his arm up and says, halt. And a white Mercedes traveling toward the road comes to a halt. The father who was driving, mother, grandmother, aunt, group of children, packed car, whole family. You know, there was a lot of bombing going on. People were trying to get away from it. The father, being a member of the Ba'ath Party, reached out the window and gave the international sign of solidarity in response to what he had seen. And then he proceeded forward, believing that he had made a communication with this Marine. And those on the ground shot and killed everyone in the car. That night, because we don't care about our troops enough to give them tents or places to sleep, the young soldier slept in Matt's truck. It had been a grueling and difficult day, and the soldier drifted off to sleep. But every couple minutes, he would wake up screaming, and Matt would hug him. And he'd say, it's OK. It's OK, brother. It's all right. Bad things happen in a war. And he would hold this man until he drifted off to sleep again. And then a few minutes later, the young Marine would stir again and scream out. And Matt would hold him again as he cried openly and say, it's OK, brother. Terrible things happen in a war. And the young Marine said to Matt, no, you don't understand. I am a Christian, and I have just killed innocent men and women for no reason whatsoever. I'm going to hell, and there's nothing you can tell me that will make this better. And Matt turned to him, and he said, No, brother, you're not going to hell. The people who sent us here are going to hell. Now, when I hear a story like Matt Howard's, I despair. It is the appropriate response. And when I hear General Petraeus and Vice President Cheney 
and President Bush say, oh, we must surge 10 or 20,000 more young men as handsome, as brave, as good as Matt Howard and his comrade into the quagmire that is Iraq, I despair. And when I hear the Vice President of the United States speak casually about launching a more deadly, more dramatically dangerous war against the more internationally aligned and powerful nation of Iran, I despair. And when I see Democrats and Republicans in the Congress of the United States, which was elected in November of 2006 for the sole purpose of ending this war and holding to account those who opened this conflict, I despair. And then I come out on a Saturday night in Englewood, Colorado. And I look in a church across a room full of patriotic, good Americans who have taken time from their family, from their work, from their responsibilities to gather and discuss the work of renewing our constitutional republic. And I realize I have no indulgence of despair. I do not have the privilege. I do not have the privilege of sorrow or sympathy for myself. I have a responsibility to stand before you and to say, courage, patriots. The Republic is in danger. The Constitution has been attacked. Democracy itself is under threat. But we are the descendants of revolutionaries who took up arms against a king named George. And so I stand before you tonight and I say, my name is John Nichols, and I want to impeach the President and the Vice President of the United States. I want to impeach them for lying about the reasons for going to war in Iraq. I want to impeach them for lying to the Congress of the United States and the American people in direct contravention of the Constitution itself, which sets up a system of separation of powers that requires, does not permit, does not allow, that requires the President of the United States as the servant of the Congress in a time of war to speak truthfully and openly, transparently to that Congress about all details regarding that war. When the President and the Vice President lied about the reasons for going to war, they committed an impeachable offense. I want to impeach them for spying on the people of the United States. I don't want to impeach them because of the FISA Act. The FISA Act sounds like some kind of bureaucracy on the back of your tax form. I want to impeach them because the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says that we shall be free in our homes from spying and interventions by the government of the United States, the President and the Vice President with their spying have committed an impeachable act. I want to impeach them for sanctioning and encouraging torture and extraordinary rendition. Now, I have friends who say, well, they have violated the Geneva Conventions. And I respect the Geneva Conventions. They are, of course, the law of the land. Any treaty we sign on to becomes the law of the United States. But I don't have to go to the Geneva Conventions to find my argument 
against torture and extraordinary rendition, the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States bars cruel and unusual punishment against those who are held in the custody of the United States by their sanctioning of torture and extraordinary rendition. The President and the Vice President have committed impeachable acts. And I want to impeach them for what they did to Joe Wilson and Valerie Plame. When the Congress of the United States considered the impeachment of Richard Nixon, the third article of impeachment against that crook, and might I add that today is the 34th anniversary of Richard Nixon's statement, I am not a crook. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> Said it in an interview. Turned out he was wrong. <laughs> but when the Congress of the United States considered the impeachment of Richard Nixon, the House Judiciary Committee, the third article of impeachment against Richard Nixon approved by Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, was for the use of his office to punish his political critics. When George Bush and Dick Cheney and Karl Rove and Scooter Libby set out to punish Joe Wilson by exposing his wife and putting her out of work when they approved the spying on Quakers and other peace activists, when they took all of the other actions they have taken to undermine their political critics, when they used the U.S. attorneys of the United States to prevent blacks and Hispanics from voting, when they committed all of these acts, they committed high crimes and misdemeanors. The president and the vice president have committed impeachable acts. Now, now I know you're sitting here right now and you're saying, you know, this Nichols fellow, he's pretty smart come up with a whole bunch of reasons for impeaching the president and the vice president. Didn't even get to Katrina yet. That is an impeachable act, by the way. Yeah. Can I just I would take a little Katrina deviation here? Because we're, we're among such, such good and, and decent people. I think you will understand this better than, than some. Better than Denny Hastert. You know, he just left Congress. Nobody even noticed. But but, uh, but Denny Hastert's reaction to Katrina was, well, you know, who needed New Orleans anyway? I'm not kidding. He was like, well, why rebuild it? You know, what the heck? Bourbon Street was okay. But Katrina was an impeachable 